of Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 through 9. I'm not going to be that long this morning, but I'm going to, I'm going to give you enough that's going to challenge you, I hope, to uh, rebuild the altars in your life, okay? But most of all, the importance of building them. And so it's not so much rebuilding. Well, it is a little bit, but building altars. Right here in Genesis chapter 12, we're going to read 1 through 9. Um, Genesis 12, 1 through 9, uh, this is the story of Abraham and uh, some of the first altars that he built. Um, the Bible says here in Genesis 12, 1, Now the Lord had said to Abraham, Get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great. And you shall be a blessing, and bless those who bless you. I will bless those who bless you. He goes on to say, and I will curse those who curse you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Someone say, Father Abraham, Father Abraham. had many sons, many, sons. <laughs> many sons and daughters. Verse 4, so Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken uh, to him, and Lot went with him. My God. That's a whole other message that I'm going to preach. But how many of there's always someone trying to, try, trying to cling to you when you're doing good? Anyway, another message. And Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Then Abraham took Sarah, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son. So there he is again, making a guest appearance. And they uh, took all their possessions that they had gathered and the people whom they had required, uh, acquired in Haran, and they departed to go to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan. Verse 6, Abraham passed through the land to a place called Shechem. I'll let you hear about that in a little bit, as far as, as the terebinth tree in Moriah. And the Canaanites were there in the land, so there were some enemies in there. So, Verse 7, then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, to your descendants I will give this land. So in other words, this is, this is all you and your descendants. Even though there's enemies here right now, it's all yours. And there he, what, built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him, verse 8 and 9. And he moved from there to the mountain of the east to Bethel. Someone say Bethel. And he pitched his tent in Bethel on the west side of Ai to the east. And there he built an altar. So there's a second altar. that The Lord had called him on the name of the Lord, verse 9. And Abraham journeyed, going on still toward the south. Father, bless your word in Jesus' name. Amen. You can go ahead and be seated this morning. For the next few moments, I want to speak to you on the importance of building altars. And we are still, yes, under the sermon series called Hashtag Woke. And uh, the Lord put this message, however, in my heart because we're talking about revival, right? That's the undertone here, revival. Someone say revival. And we discovered last week that revival isn't necessarily bringing in a preacher for three to four to five to seven days and having church services and calling that revival. That's, you know, that's, yeah, that's, what, that's something else. But revival starts in our hearts as believers. I believe some of us here today, this morning, under the sound of my voice, uh, you're, you're, you've plateaued in your walk with God. You've kind of settled for the status quo and said, this must be it for me. I've experienced it all and, you know, God's given me back so much and I'm good and I'm okay where I'm at. I'm here to tell you today, don't believe the lies of the enemy because that's why we need to get spiritually woke this morning. But how do we get, how do we get woke in a sense? Well, we got to rebuild these altars and build the altars within our life. Today I want to share with you for a few moments the importance of building these altars. Now if you talk to any godly man or any godly woman concerning their conversion or even their longevity in life or even the point of their first encounter with God or their moment of transformation, I can guarantee you that there was an altar involved. 
When I say altar, I'm not talking about a piece of furniture in some ancient tabernacle. I'm not talking about an area in a cathedral or a wooden prayer rail in a church. Come on, somebody. I'm not talking or speaking about some physical pile of stone as in our opening scripture or our opening text with Abraham had done. So please understand this morning that all of the above are legitimate expressions of an altar. Okay? But because I have no problem, let me just say this, with wooden rails, high altars, you know, altars that signify and mean prayer and worship, I believe they are all important and have the ability and the tendency to restore strength and impart new life. Most of us have an experience where we have come to an altar, have knelt down, and experienced a life-changing moment within our life. Someone say amen. amen. But we need to be careful. Come on, somebody. Because that's just sometimes just the thing to do. We come to the altar sometimes out of habit. Or we come because, you know, someone's possibly watching us. What the altar is not, we need to understand, is the altar is not a place just for sinners. It's for all of us. Someone say all of us. All of us. So I know sometimes we don't come to the altar because, well, I'm not a sinner. <laughs> or I'm not in sin at this moment right now in my life. So if I go up there, people are going to start judging me and start looking at me weird and thinking that everything pastor taught about, it's me. Well, that's, that's a lie yeah. from the pit of hell. Yeah. Sunday after Sunday, listen carefully now, we come to get pardoned from our sins. And then we go home and keep living the same old way. Why? Someone say why. why? Because we're pardoned, but we don't think we did anything wrong. I'll say amen to myself, man. We come here, God forgive me, Lord thank you, I'm good again, I'm great, I'm awesome. And we go back and live the same life we've been living. That's not how it's supposed to go. And the reason why I've noticed that people do that is because we're pardoned from our sin. How many thank God you're pardoned from your sin, but then we go back and don't think we did anything wrong? Well, I don't see what I did wrong. All I did was rob a bank. Well, it's my mama's fault, my daddy's fault, my uncle's fault, my auntie's fault. It was their fault. Always blaming other people. So we're parted, but we don't think we did anything wrong. See, the altar has the power to alter the direction of a human life. The altar has the power to change the fabric of a person's character. The altar has the power to shape the realization of someone's destiny. I wish I had a church to preach to today. When I begin to study these altars in Abraham's life, for instance, the just depends on what book you read or what commentary you read or what preacher you listen to. But there's roughly seven to eight altars. Now that word, the reason why there's so many uh, different, different uh, thoughts about that is because when you read about Abraham's altars, uh, some, of, some of the moments that Abraham had don't say altar. It just says he talked to God. Some people think, well, that's an altar. That's that's, that's what altars do. That's what altars are for. And so, again, I'm going to talk to you about just three of them today, and then I'm going to pray for you because I really need us to understand this morning that, that we need to have these altars within our life. You see, whenever Ab Abraham uh, went, wherever he went, the Bible says he built an altar. Why did he build it? He built it so that he could worship God. Now the altars represent true worship. And true worship involves a surrender. True worship involves a sacrifice, which I'll talk a little bit about today. And a true altar will represent also service. Abraham would have, uh, according to Moses in Genesis chapter 20, verse 25, Moses built an altar. And the Lord told Moses, I want you to build an altar, but just go get a little, just, just, just go get a stone. And I don't want no tool to touch it. I don't want no man to touch it. I don't want anybody carving anything of it. Just go get a stone and place it there, and that'll be the altar. 
Now, why, why, why would the Lord instruct Moses to do that? Because that's the same, uh, that, that's the same pattern that Abraham followed. Just get a stone and start building, building an altar. Because, because, because that, that, that stone or that rock could just represent any old common thing. Your couch can be your altar. Well, now I got to go to Home Depot and get some stones and get some rocks and all that. No, just your couch. A chair. Come on, somebody. Taking a prayer walk. I don't know how you can pray and walk, but you'll need to. You'll need more prayer if, if it'll cause you to pray more. Any old place can be your altar or my altar. So the number one thing I want to talk to you about that we all need an altar. Number one, we need an altar for personal encounter. Someone say personal encounter. The Bible says that he went, left and went to Shechem. Shechem in the Hebrew simply means the shoulder. Or it means a place to carry burdens. So as he built this altar, as Abraham built this altar, the Lord would appear and begin to bear all of his burdens and it would keep him from being barren, living a cursed life, or living an unfruitful type of life. Someone say personal encounter. So that's why we need an altar. Because we got to personally encounter the power of God in our life. As we built this altar, the Lord will begin to bear our burdens. Every day, someone say every day. Every day. We must set aside time to come to our personal altar. It gets quiet around here. Where we read his word, where we worship him. Come on, somebody. When we sing to him, pray to him, here is where we encounter him in a fresh, brand new way. My friend, you and I need these altars in our life. I thank God for the church altar. I thank God for this altar. I've seen men, there's a lot of tears in, these, in this carpet here. They're starting to change colors now. There's a lot of, you know. Stuff in these carpets. If you were to get a. Get a light. What's those lights? Those. Uh, I don't know if we want to do that. There's a lot of there's a lot of seeds sown in this carpet. There's a lot of personal drama and trauma and different things that people have come here. Lives have been changed because of an encounter here at this altar. It's been a place of personal encounter. I remember my first altar call ever in my life was on a midweek service there in Victory Outreach Hayward on a Wednesday night. Come on, somebody. And they, the, the speaker opened up the altars for us to go up there. And I remember feeling this tugging in my heart and going up to that altar. and never have experienced that before. I fell to my knees, and I began to cry out to God. And lo and behold, I felt some hand touch my shoulder. And that was a little weird. That was a little odd to me. That was a little different to me. And I looked to see who was touching me, and it was, it was my mom's hand. Come on, somebody. My mom was there. I, I noticed the hand, and, 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 and as I was crying, she was crying, and it was a place of personal encounter. I'm here to tell you today, Victory Outreach Fremont, you and I need these altars of personal encounter. Having a personal encounter on Sunday only will not cut it anymore. If we don't have a place like this, we must build it now. You got to go home and build it now. This altar was the same place when I began to study this that Jacob later built his well on. It also existed in Jesus' time. It was the place where he met the Samaritan woman. And she began to draw water. You remember that. And Jesus came and he had this conversation with her. And, and, and this conversation that they had, you know, uh, he began to say, you're, you're searching for something in this well that if you drink it, you'll always be thirsty. He said, but if you knew who was standing in front of you, you would never thirst again. At one time, this was Abraham's first altar that he built. 
And now Jacob's well was now there on the same exact spot. You ain't hearing me today. It was still being used as a place of refreshing. It was still being used as a place of personal encounter. We will find this personal altar to be a place of great personal refreshing. How many want to get refreshed, man? How many need to be refreshed? Oh, man, I, I, I need to be refreshed. I need a fresh touch. I'm tired of last year's touch. I'm tired of five years ago's touch from God. I'm tired about talking about my 22-year-ago breakthrough. I'm tired of talking about last month's breakthrough. I'm tired of talking about when God first touched me. There was, yeah, anyway. Someone say a fresh touch. We need an altar of personal encounter. Second altar that we need, and there are many, but I'm going to give you a few here today. The second one is you and I need an altar of personal worship. Don't turn me off now. I know that's a, a Christian word here today. And we hear worship and we're like, ah, oh, been there, done that. Or if we've never heard it, we're like, ah, oh, I don't know if I could do that. Listen carefully. This altar was built between Bethel. If, if you read it, I, it was the second altar he built. The Bible says it was built between Bethel and Ai. Symbolically, what's that mean? Bethel means the house of God. Ai means house of ruins. So he builds this altar between the house of God and the house of ruins. Worship, worshiping God and calling on his name in the house of God, listen carefully now, will keep you from a ruined life. So learning to worship God here. Learning to worship God at home. Learning to worship God in your house. Learning to worship God at the gym. Learning to worship God on your walk, at your job, in your cubicle. Everywhere you're dropping those kids off. At school. The sure way to keep everybody quiet in the car is just turn some worship music on. From the morning on Halleck and I wake, the moment we wake up in the morning until the moment we leave the house, we just have worship music on. I got it in the morning, uh, it, it downstairs, we got it upstairs, we got it on our phones, everywhere I go, I take my dog for a walk, I got worship music, because if anybody needs God, my dog needs God. <laughs> kind of getting close to giving his life to God, but <laughs> pray for him. <laughs> Some would say worship, but it's not good enough just to worship him here yeah. in the house of God. It's not enough to have an altar of worship here because how many know it's easier to worship? And thank God for this. But when we go back home where, and we got all these in-between seasons where it's the house of God and things, things have the potential to be ruined, what do you do in between that? Abraham knew that I got to go back and build an altar there too. See, we need worship and we need to worship together with our families and the family of God. This is not possible if the first altar is not in place. If you and I do not have the altar of personal encounter, there's no way we can have the altar of personal worship. If we don't have an altar of personal worship, we will not be able to really join in in worship as a congregation. Come on, somebody. Some people do not enter into anointed worship at church because they not have learned to worship God all alone. So my worship here is just an indication of my worship at home. My worship here is just an overflow, an outflow of what's been going on in my personal life. I, don't, I could not wait seven days to worship God if all I did was worship him here. Some people do not enter into it because they have not learned to worship God alone. Come on, somebody. We can't blame the worship team, the sound team, the media team, the instruments, the acoustics. It's too hot in here. Now it's too cold. These lights bother me. It's too dark. It's too light. I can't worship. I can't think. I can't do this. Well, get to church on time. I don't see how you... I'm going to... Like, like, 
Like how, like if you're going to be walking around, sit on the edge. I'll stop, bro. I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop because you ain't ready for that. It's too early. You can't blame every, we must blame ourselves for not having this altar of personal worship at home. You ain't hearing me. I'm trying to help you today. I want revival. I want breakthrough in my life. Well, it starts with us. My question is, do you have an altar at home? Do you have an altar, a personal altar at home? I lost half of you now. When a famine came upon Abraham, he lost trust in God, and he forsook Bethel, the house of God. And the Bible says he went to Bethel after this. And as he went to Bethel, it almost ruined his life. Oh, excuse me, left Bethel and went to, went to Egypt. It almost ruined his life. It almost ruined him. Um, as he got and started heading in that direction towards, towards Egypt, that's where he got into, uh, start lying. And he, told, he told his wife, Sarah, hey, we're going to head into this city and uh, we, need, we need to basically tell everybody that you're my sister. You're my sister wife. Because if, because, because if they find out that you're my wife, they're going to kill me and keep you. And you don't want me to, anything to happen to me. And he conjures up this, see how easy it happens? And he got off track. And the only way to get back on track, if you keep reading it, is he came back to Bethel. He came back to this original second altar that he built. And he said, my life got out of hand and it got out of hand really quick. I made some really quick, bad decisions. See, t sometimes when a famine comes on our life and uh, it, it's, it's hard to lean in to our Christian walk, we can seek to trust other sources other than trusting God. Yeah. See, that's what Abraham did. Instead of remaining at the altar and trusting God, he fled to Egypt which represents the world. When he finally came back, he had to return to the same altar and once again call upon the name of the Lord. Don't miss that. Please don't miss that simple simplicity of this message here today. I'm trying to get us to think about our own lives today and think about what is, this, what is the condition of my altar today? Do I have a personal encounter altar? Do I have an altar in my life. See, the beautiful thing is that God did not cast him off. You notice that? But graciously received him again as he humbled himself at this altar and his family was able to benefit from it. So we see here, number one, is we have to have an altar of personal encounter and an altar of personal worship. And then thirdly and lastly, we see, and as you continue to study Abraham's life, there was an altar of sacrifice. Someone say sacrifice. sacrifice. And we know this, that in Genesis chapter 22, the Bible says that God tested Abraham. Someone say God tested Abraham. I think our biggest challenge with us as a generation and Christians today is that we sacrifice sacrifice. You see, in the early, in the late 70s and early 80s, there was three altars that were built here in Northern California. There was a San Jose altar, there was a Hayward altar, and there was a San Francisco altar. Three couples felt the call of God to come up to Northern California and start a ministry. And if you know any of their stories, you've been around any amount of time, then you know that when Pastor Ed and Sister Mitzi, Pastor Steve and Sister Josie, and Pastor Gilbert came out here in, during that time, they came out here with the spirit of sacrifice. Pastor Steve used to share with us all the time that when they came out here, they were living in a car. 
until they found a house. And there were times when they didn't have money. Because they didn't have money, their two-year-old son, who's now pastoring the church today, didn't have food. They would talk about their sacrifice. They would talk about all the things that they had to believe God and trust God in. Sacrifice. We got to get that altar of sacrifice back. The Bible says that Abraham was going up because the Lord told him, take your son Isaac. And we know the story. And just as he was about to sacrifice his son Isaac on the altar, the voice of the Lord came. And in a race, basically, he just said, I just want to see if you would sacrifice. I just want to see if you would do it. I think this is a heavy point here today because me personally, I don't want a Christianity that costs me nothing. I don't want a blessing that costs me nothing. Now I know there's been some promises that have been given to, to us where we are going to inherit vineyards we never worked for. We're going to eat fruit we never planted. We're going to drink from wells that we never dug. And I appreciate those that have went before me and have sacrificed for me. But I don't want things just handed to me. I'm willing to put an altar of sacrifice inside of my life so that I could experience everything that God has for me. I don't want to, I'll do it when I feel like it, Christianity. Well, I don't feel like doing it today. I don't feel like going today. I don't feel like serving today. Could you imagine if the team would have said, I don't feel like singing today. What if the sound guy said, I don't feel like plugging stuff in today. What if Chris got on this ladder and said, I don't feel like falling today. But if these two young gentlemen came and said, I don't feel like taking the pulpit today. I don't feel like putting it up there for pastor. He never drinks the water anyway. <laughs> I don't feel like it. I think we got to get past our emotions. And we got to get to a, a place of sacrifice. This altar of sacrifice. I think King David said, I don't want anything that hasn't cost me anything. I want my family saved. I want my marriage better. I want this and I want that. Let me tell you, anything of value, you're going to have to pay a price. You're going to have to pay a price. There's an altar of personal encounter. I know it was simple today. There's an altar of personal worship. And there's also, we cannot forget to have an altar of sacrifice. Don't settle. For a status quo relationship with God. God is taking this church as deep as it wants to go. He's going to bless it as deep as it wants to sacrifice. I'm tired of same old, same old. I'm tired of mechanical services. I'm tired of regular stuff. When I know that there's so much more that God wants to do. And you can feel that he's doing it. He's working it out for you. He's working it out for you. Come on, women's home. He's working it out for you. Men in the men's home, he's working it out for you. Trinity, he's working it out for you. I've been picking on you a lot lately because he's working it out for you. He's working it out for you. He's got it all worked out. But my question for you is what's the condition of your altar? Well, man, it ain't. You don't need much. The Lord told Moses, just get a rock. As long as you could put a little bit of wood on it, a 
as long as you could put a little a sheep or an ox, as long as you could kind of, don't even need to all be on it, just enough. Don't have to be pretty. Don't have to be from, you know, from Ikea. It just has to be a place where you are able to get alone with me. And you're able to have a personal encounter with God again. You're able to say, God, this is my place of sacrifice every morning. I'm getting up a little earlier now. See, that's sacrifice. I'm going to get up a half an hour earlier. Come on, somebody. Well, I don't want to wake God up. God's already up. You get up. You put some coffee on. Get that Juan Valdez anointing going on in your life. Instead of spending all your money on Starbucks, spend it, invest it in your own little Starbucks thing. Well, I got to, no, forget about Starbucks. You should just call it 10 bucks because everything there is 10 bucks. Every time you walk out, it's more than 10 bucks. Anyway, this is my personal altar right here. This is my moment. This is, I'm waking up 30 minutes earlier and I'm washing my face and I'm, please brush your, brush your teeth. I, I got a little sweatshirt, my little prayer sweatshirt. Put it on, tie up the neck. Come on, somebody. Yeah, put my little sweats on. Put my little Kurg. Is it called a Kurg? Is that the right Kurg? Yeah, put my Kurg on. I put my Kurg on. <laughs> 2 point one seconds. It's done. Come on. Got my creamer going on. Got my Splenda. Got my YouTube. Got my Eddie Cepeda. Got my William McDowell. How? Boom. Come on, Lord. And I sit on my, my couch. I down my coffee, make sure I'm awake. Then I get on my knees. I just start thanking God. God, I want a personal encounter with you today, Lord. This is my altar, my couch, my corner of my couch. This is my altar, God. I, Lord, God, I need you today in my life. I give you this day. Every moment of this day, I give it to you today, God. Because I want a personal encounter. I want to feel your presence. I want to know your presence, God. I've been dry lately. I've been, I've been, I've been this and I've been that. God, I give you my family, God. I want to pray for my family right now, God. I like hedge of protection over my family, God. Touch my kids, God. Touch my marriage, God. Touch my finances, God. I I don't go a day without praying for my family. I pray for my brothers, my sisters, my nephews. I, I lift them up to God. I want them to have a personal encounter. They may not know it when they get up and go to school or when they get up and go to work, but they have an uncle. They have a brother. They have somebody, a father that is there in the morning while everyone else is asleep. He is at his altar, building his altar, cultivating his altar, protecting his altar, encountering his altar, sacrificing at his altar. Come on, lift up those hands. Lift up those hands. Lift up those hands. You need an altar. I need an altar. You need an altar. Personal worship is simple. Lift up those hands. 